Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to today's uh, IS Distinguished Seminar. I'm Xin Hua Zhen from ISOM. Uh, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce our very distinguished speaker, Professor Tony Tsai from Wharton. And uh, Professor Tsai is a world renowned statistician, and uh, he's now the Dorothy Silverberg Professor of Statistics at, at Wharton. Um, he has won numerous awards. In particular, he is the recipient of the 2008 uh, Corps President Award and also the Medallion Lecture. And Professor Tsai has been editor or associate editor of almost all top journals in statistics. In particular, he has been the editor of Annals of Statistics. And he has also served the leading roles in our profession and uh, uh, in addition to serving uh, leading roles in, in many committees, he's going to be the president of the International Chinese Statistical Society, ICSA. And thanks to him, we are going to have an ICSA conference on data science in the coming July in Dali. So I'm looking forward to it. And Professor Tsai has made the fundamental contributions in many fields, uh, most notably high-dimensional statistical influence large-scale multiple testing, functional data analysis, statistical decision theory, non-parametric fun functional uh, estimation, and uh, the application to genomics on, and, and, and so on and so forth. And today, uh, Professor Tsai is going to tell us about uh, some problems on big, on big data. So let's welcome. Thank you very much, Xinhua, for the generous introduction. And I. I should first say that when I was asked to give this talk, and I decided to give a different kind of talk. At least this talk will be different from any other talk I give. Normally, I give we talk about one single problem and provide a solution to the problem. And since this is more or less a public lecture, so I'm only going to talk about problems. And it means that there's no solution. And some of the problems I have been working on for several years. And some of the problems I don't know how to answer. And some of the problems are so large that it will take, I think, years to really make huge progress. And I think there's no question that we are in the age of big data. And as you can tell from all sorts of media and news articles, and, and there's some big words like big data or data science. And according to people, if it's developed as we imagined, this is going to change our lifestyle. And not too many technologies can do that. I think the last time it happened was internet. And it can be seen from many, many different places, and this is about an article in New York Times about the age of big data and how useful a person with data analytical skills can do in for industry and also for management and social media and so on and so forth. And I think in a feature article in Harvard Business Review, it says data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. I think I've been doing this for a while and never connect myself with something <laughs> sexy. But it's good. I think we'll take that. And we all know that as technology develops, the amount of data available becomes larger and larger. That's why it's called big data. And from image data to video to text to all sorts of other type. And the, the size of the data clearly has increased dramatically. But to statisticians, I think what's more significant is not just the sheer size of data sets. What's more significant is that now we encounter problems with many different, different types of data, and some of which we have not really seen much before, including network data or graphs, even shapes. For example, in brain imaging analysis, and people are very interested in the evolution of the shape of brain. 
We all know that as people age, we, the memory starts to decay, although we typically don't admit and always claim that there's too much stuff to do. That's why I don't remember as well. But actually, the function degenerates. But what's interesting is that the shape itself actually changes. And to medical researchers, they're very interesting in knowing that how shape changes as people age. And in terms of application, certainly there's no shortage. There's a wide range of applications from medicine to science to engineering, for example. A big area of research at the moment is quantum computing. And in quantum computing, a big problem is to estimate a very high dimensional density matrix. So now it's not a density function, but a density matrix. And that density matrix is highly structured. But due to randomness, we only have access to empirical data, which can be used to estimate such a high dimensional density matrix. And the problem is very intriguing, and, but it's also very important because it's, if it's successful, the next generation or next next generation of computer will be totally different in terms of its form and also in terms of its ability. And big data is also widely used in business from risk management to portfolio allocation and to government. And I think we read in the news articles, newspapers from time to time that someone is caught cheating, inside trading. But how can you catch people with inside trading? Because every day we have mil millions and billions of trades. How can you find out which trade is abnormal? And that requires a lot of techniques, statistical techniques. And there are many, many challenges with analysis of big data. And one, the first one, of course, is massiveness. Data is simply too big. And how to compute is a big problem, or how to even handle them. Another to statisticians, a very important feature of big data is high dimensionality. The object of interest is of very high dimension. And classical statistical methods or theory does not work anymore. You cannot simply say modify the old method to handle new kind of data. It doesn't work. Both empirically and theoretically, you can prove that those methods are no good. So if you open up any classical say, multivariate analysis book, you can always ask the question, can this method still be used? in high dimension? The answer is almost universally no. So basically, we need to write new textbooks. And there are many other features. Heterogeneity, and another very interesting topic of current research is what's called distributed inference. The data set is so big that you cannot hold all of them in a single place, on a single computer. So they, has to, they have to be stored in many different computers. You can do statistical analysis on any one of them or any one part of the data, but you have no chance of looking at them all at once. Uh, if you think about statistical theory, virtually all the existing theory is about a given data set, how to come up with the optimal method to solve it. It has no other constraint. Now, every time you can only see a small portion of data, and how can you combine them together to get an optimal method? And I will come back to this point towards the end. Another very important and very intriguing phenomena in big data is the trade-off between statistical accuracy and computational efficiency. And we all want to, be, to have methods that can be computed fast. On the other hand, we also want to have methods that produce accurate results. And there are quite a few recent problems that people show that there's an intrinsic trade-off or tension between those two goals. You cannot achieve those two goals simultaneously. Anything that's statistical, statistically optimal now can be shown that they cannot be implemented in polynomial time. It's not because we are not smart enough. It's because the problem is too hard. But anything that's not computable is not useful. 
and anything is at the moment is computable, you can show they're not good. So now you're stuck. And there are many people in statistics and also in theoretical computer science are working on this type of problem. And there are many, many other difficulties. I will not mention them one by one. So I'll start with a brief discussion on a very big area on big data. It's personalized medicine. And according to people, if this line of research becomes successful, life ex expectancy can be increased significantly by 10 or 20 years. And it's also known, well known that healthcare is very expensive. In the US back in 1970s, the, out, the total cost for healthcare is about 7.2%. 7 and in a few years, according to the prediction, it will jump to a quarter of the GDP. So it's very, very expensive. And in, in the old days, or currently, what's the best practice of medicine? Suppose you don't feel well, then you'll go to see the doctor, right? And the doctor will take some measurements of you, for example, blood pressure or temperature or anything that he can do. And of course, the purpose of doing all those type of measurements is try to determine what kind of illness you have. And after that's decided, the doctor will prescribe medicine for you. Uh, if you're not so sure or you don't trust your doctor very well, you would ask, is this the best medicine available? And the doctor almost universally assure you that that's the best medicine for this disease. And typically, you're happy and go home. But in this whole discussion, there's no mentioning whether that treatment is best for you. Because best for this disease means that it's best on average. And currently, for any real disease, a treatment is very good if it's useful for 60 or 70% of people with that disease. And personalized medicine, the goal is totally different, is try to come up with a treatment not just best for the disease, but best for you as an individual. So, and in order to achieve that kind of goal, we need a lot more information about people, including gene genetic information. So that big effort almost everywhere try to come up with database, huge e electronic database about disease. And there are significant efforts to treat several common diseases, for example, arthritis, diabetes, heart disease, cancer. And the goal is in a few years, or maybe 10 or 20 years, we have enough information about those diseases and also the progression of the disease after giving certain treatment. Now, then in the future, if someone has a disease, then you can look at, at the past experience among all patients and all doctors, not just the experience of a single doctor. So in this case, we want to have to use information about a person's biological and genetic makeup to come up with strategies for the prevention and also uh, treatment of disease. And it's certain, uh, certainly a very one of the most important problem involving big data. And uh, it's not easy to come up with uh, such treatment or even building up the, the system takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. But once we have the data, it involves a lot of statistical analysis. And there are many, many different aspects in this endeavor. And certainly, we want to construct prediction rules where statistical modeling, and we also need to evaluate the performance of any particular prediction rule and then form personalized treatment strategy. And this type of problem often involves very high dimensional data. And the problem is tricky. It's not something straightforward. And one particular kind of problem is what's called copy number variation. And copy number variation 
is about detecting the variation in copy numbers, as the name indicates. And if a person is normal or, or at any particular location, we should have a pair of genes. One come from the father, one come from the mother. But for whatever reason, occasionally in some location, you have what's called duplication. You have more than a pair, you have several more copies. In some other location, it can be deletion. Instead of having a pair, you only have one, or sometimes you have none. And for some part of the genome, having CMV doesn't cause any problem because human genome is highly redundant. But there are places that are very important, very crucial. And for those places, if you have CMV, it will cause very serious problem. And the recent studies, for example, connecting autism with CMV and bipolar disorder and many, many other cardiovascular disease, many, many diseases that, that are associated with copy number variation. And they're very important problems or questions to ask. First of all, CNV itself is detected based on statistical analysis because the human genomes, we cannot look at them, say, one by one or as a pair, right? It's done indirectly. And the genome-wide observations are very large. Basically, for a single person, the observation is a vector of length half a million to a million and even longer. And the question is how to detect whether there's something different from the baseline. Another is we need to know the relationship between the CMV and the particular disease because having CMV doesn't mean that you must have the disease. It's not deterministic. And even the first question is very difficult. The reason is that the CMV itself is very sparse. The signal is very sparse and very short, although the whole vector itself is very long. And the number of CMV typically is less than 30, and the segment length is less than 20. So overwhelming part of the observation is noise. And the question is how to detect the signal from noise. And if you look at the original experiment, What's observed is something like that. It's very fuzzy, very noisy. It's not something clean. And we need to develop a statistical method to detect whether there's certain segment, a short segment that has signal that's, that deviates from the baseline. And that's why it, statistical analysis is very important in this line of research. And another kind of problem that's different but associated, uh, related is EEG data. Now, EEG data is about brain wave. And if you look at the observations, this is normal. So if you look at this, that's sort of like periodic and, and you don't see any pattern. And that's for a normal person. And for pers people with disease, for example, a big effort at Penn at med medical school, there's a big group studying epilepsy. And for people with epilepsy, um, most of the time, the brain function is very normal. But at some point, it starts to become very high frequency. And the question is, what's going to happen next? It's, it's, it's possible that it becomes more and more high frequency, and eventually, the person has an onset of epilepsy. And that's very painful and also very annoying. And it turns out, if you know that it's coming, there's a very simple way of treating it. You just apply very small amount of electric shock to a certain part of brain. It will go away. It becomes normal again. And I have never been shot by electricity, but according to people who had the experience, it feels like you, you pinched by a needle. And it's very uncomfortable, but it's tolerable. So if you know that it's coming, you would rather to be pinned by a needle than have the onset of the disease, right? But on the other hand, if it's not coming, you, you would rather not to have it. So the question is, how can we come up with a method to accurately 
predict what's coming in the next second or so. And their goal, eventual goal is to come up with something similar to pacemaker. And pacemaker is, to reg is a device that imprint to regulate the heartbeat. And it has been very, very useful for people with heart irregularity. It's very useful. And if this is successful, they want to have something that's imprinted in, in the head, in the brain, uh, to regulate a uh, brain wave. And in all this type of problem, you can see that the amount of data is huge. But this is basically continuous. And, and there are many, many of these type of observations. And another kind of problem in high dimensional statistics and also in big data involves different kinds of data from more conventional ones. Those involves matrices, graphs, and networks. And there are many, many different kinds of matrices. For example, in statistics, a very important matrix is covariance matrix. And that tells us the relationship between variables. And precision matrix is the inverse of the covariance matrix and typically tells us the graph structure of the variables and the many, many other kinds of matrices and also graphs. And there are many problems, both in medicine and also in other applications where you need to deal with this type of problems. And one very significant problem in medicine is try to study disease network. And at the moment, the diseases are classified according to their symptoms. If you say, if you have fever, then you have fever, you have temperature, you have fever. And if you have, say, diabetes, you have diabetes. And it turns out that many diseases occur almost simultaneously, not to every person, but to a large extent. For example, uh, people with diabetes, more than two thirds of them eventually die of heart attack, not of diabetes. So there must be, we don't even need to be a doctor, right? There must be some underlying structure that ties those two diseases together. Some deficiency in our function that cause both of those two diseases. And the question is, how can we connect the different diseases together? So if we have that information, it means that those diseases can be studied, or some of them can be studied simultaneously. And they shouldn't be classified separately. And the same kind of application also arises in other fields, for example, in finance or signal processing, web search, and so on. And here's one, also one big problem about brain function. And the human brain is very complex. And a big problem is to know which part of the brain is associated with what kind of function. And last time I went to, I was in Germany attending a conference and there's one computer scientist from Max Planck Institute. And he showed his study and he showed a, a small segment of a view, video when he was doing the experiment. And, um, and, and he, his head was, uh, has many devices that attached to his head. And then he sat in front of a computer, a big screen with nothing on it. Then at some moment, a green ball appeared suddenly from one corner to another. And then the device on his head rec records his uh, brain activity. And so they try to determine, say, for example, say whether this part of the brain is associated with vision. As we read in the newspapers from time to time, say someone has some very, say someone who is blind for a long time, but after some very extraordinary event, for example, say lightning, it was, and suddenly he can see. So it's not the eyes, the function of eyes it's themselves are not good. It's the connection between the eyes and the brain 
has been damaged. And so it's very important to know which part of the brain is associated with what kind of function. And also the brain, they're not always contiguous. Sometimes physically, two regions are far apart, but they are associated with the same function. So a very important problem is to construct brain networks. And this is a very important problem in network analysis about brain network. And this is about disease I have mentioned earlier. And people are very interested in knowing the connections among different kinds of diseases. And in all these type of problems, you want to reconstruct the network. And this is a toy example about the voting records of senators. Yeah. And you can, the notes, it's not surprising that they divide mainly by along party line. But occasionally you see people who cross the party line, and the data is relatively old, it's 2004 and 2006. And Lincoln Chaffee from Rhode Island was here with Democrats. And not surprisingly, that the next year he was up for re election as a Republican. They don't support him. And if I were a Republican, I think I would not support him either. Right. He's voting with the other side. And other kind of application also arises. And social, net, social network or social media certainly is a big part of big data. And it's very useful for commercial purpose. And also, it's very useful to study certain social events. And one, I think some of you may have heard Google flu. And that's also a very interesting application of big data, because detecting any disease or onset of disease is very important. And flu it occurs almost every year, but not every year. It occurs regularly. And the common practice is when, pe when the season comes, people say have fever, they'll go to see their doctor. The doctor will collect the information and eventually combine them together layer by layer, eventually reach, say, CDC. The Center for Disease Control, and in a month or two, <coughs> CDC will announce that this year's flu season is really bad. But typically, by then, it's over. It's too slow. And, this, and Google flu use search data, try to do real-time prediction. It's much more effective. It's used in, I think, 29 countries, not, not in China. And in all this type of discussion, we sort of assume that the data, the data themselves are available to us. But in many problems, we have to design the experiment in order to collect data and to solve them. And there are many, many interesting uh, problems. And I just want to mention one. I think it's very cute. Some of you may have heard of this before. And people try to use crowdsourcing to solve to solve some very difficult, seemingly very difficult problem. And a few years ago, DARPA, which is a research agency belong to the Department of Defense in the US, and they announced this red balloon challenge. So the goal is very simple. Say they announced beforehand. Imagine today is June 24th. Say they announced one month, July 24th. They're going to put up. 10 distinct red weather balloons in the US somewhere. And the goal is try whoever identifies the GPS, the exact location for all 10 balloons wins the competition with a price of $40,000. That's all over the US, which is big. Even in Hong Kong, imagine we do this competition in Hong Kong. It's difficult, right? How can we locate 10? red balloons. And the traffic is not so good. Even if you have a very fast, fancy car, it doesn't take you too far in a limited amount of time. But what's amazing is a group of a total of 4,000 uh, 4, teams in the competition, because anyone can participate. But what's amazing was a group of MIT students did it in less than Nine hours. And they're all based in Boston. 
right? How can we find all those 10 blooms? And they come up with a very interesting strategy. And they were supervised by a game theorist, an economist. I heard that now they have a company. So what's the strategy? Turns out they set up a website. And they invite people to join. And anyone who joins needs someone to introduce them to join. So think of this as a club. You need another member to introduce you to join the club. So eventually, you have a big tree. And the incentive is that whoever discovered the location of one balloon will win $2,000. The person who is above you, who introduces you to the club, will get 1,000. And the person who above him will get five, 500, and so on. So it, geometric series. You add up for each balloon, the cost is at most 4,000. Because <laughs> on average, each balloon was 4,000. And with enough incentive, the problem was solved so quickly, it's very, very Interesting. And why the Department of Defense is interested in doing this type of competition? Certainly, it's fun. But having fun is not their goal, or at least is not their only goal. It turns out that the, the idea behind this competition is that in, in, in the event of emergency, like earthquake or, say, war, they want to find an effective method to get the right people to the right place. For example, in the event of earthquake or war, you have heavy machinery. You need people who is able to operate those machinery. Now think of those as, say, broom. And then you need to get people to there as soon as possible. And there are also many other problems that involve big matrices. And this type of problem, I think, maybe 10 years ago, almost never heard of. And but now there are more and more of these type of problems. And it requires a lot of statistical thinking to solve these problems. I think the first one is the so-called Netflix problem. And that's the recommended system. And many of you may have heard this before. In this case, you have movies and people. And so Netflix is a company that rents uh, videos. Each row represents a person, and each column represents a movie. And after you watch the movie, you give a rating to the movie. So if you don't like the movie, you give one star. If you like the movie very much, you give five star. But no matter how much you like the movie, you're not going to have enough time to watch all of them. So there are many, many empty cells on every row and every column. And the company wants to know whether you like this movie. Because if you like this unwatched movie, they will try to sell it to you. So, and so the whole problem, that's why the whole problem is called matrix completion. You want to complete the matrix. And anyone knows anything about linear al algebra would think that's impossible. Because not only a matrix with so many missing entries is difficult to complete, even you, with just one single empty cell, there's no relationship between the cells, right? You can, yeah, it can be anything. But if you think about the problem a little bit more, you realize that this type of problem is, or this type of matrices is highly structured. The movies can be classified into a few categories. And people can also be classified into a few categories. And so the matrix is approximately low rank, and the problem can be solved effectively. And this is very useful, not only to connect movie with people. Amazon, for example, sells books. They can also connect book with people. Yeah, I, haven't, I have stopped going to real bookstore for many years. I only go to Amazon to buy books whenever I need them. And so they know all my history. And they send me recommendations from time to time. And I certainly don't buy all of them. 
I, well, I take a very quick at, at the book, it's sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. And sometimes you feel that it's very scary. Because most of the books, actually, I do like. You feel that there's something in the world that know better than know better about you than yourself. I don't even know the existence of the book. And not only that, once you can tie a product with people, you can tie people with people. So this is the online dating service. And according to people that have used this algorithm, it turns out to be very useful. But there are other problems that are sort of related but different. There are newer kind of problems. Here's the logo of MIT. And it's a very nice stylized image. If we treat this image as a matrix, it's a matrix of low rank. It's rank six. And there are many problems of this type in image and signal processing. You have a highly structured image, and you want to do compression and decompression very quickly and very efficiently. And so it's a problem about low rank matrix, but with structure. A different kind that also involves low rank matrix happens in genomics. And genomic technology actually evolves very quickly, they're very fast. And the most recent one is the newest technology is called next generation sequencing data. So in this case, we take measurements of the whole genome, and for each person, it's, each row is a vector of length 3 billion. But the technology is relatively expensive and also rel re relatively time consuming. So you can only do this for any given study, you can only do this for tens or hundreds of people. So the number of rows, it's very complete, but the num number of subjects, the sample size is relatively small. And slightly older, older technology is GWAS, genome-wide association study. And in this case, people don't make measurements of every location, only make measurements on a subset, about three million. It's fast, it's inexpensive, but it's not complete. So there are many locations that you don't have observations. And now imagine you want to do statistical analysis on this type of data. There are two obvious approaches. One is you apply whatever method you like to the first part, right? It's complete, it's nice, it's complete, you can do it. Another, of course, you simply use the second part, the GWAS data to do the statistical analysis. And there are many, many subjects, but not very fine, detailed observations. I don't think you need to know much statistics to realize that neither of these methods is not efficient because we don't fully utilize the information contained in both data sets. So an interesting question is, can we integrate the two data sets together, or what's called data fusion, by estimate those unmeasured locations? And the data set as a whole matrix, the matrix is of, it's highly structured. It's very high dimensional, but it's also highly structured. And the question is, can we impute those places and then apply a statistical method for the whole matrix? And if we do a little bit of permutation, you can always move the unobserved part to the, say, last few columns. And another related problem is in many clinical trials, this is particular one, which I have happen to analyze is ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is the fifth large uh, cancer for women. And each year, there are about 50,000 people die of ovarian cancer. It's a serious disease. But this cancer is slightly different from some other more lethal cancer. For someone who has ovarian cancer and discovered relatively early they can, some of them actually respond to treatment very well. It's cured. But for other group of people, 
they, the response to the treatment actually is very poor. They will die relatively soon. And the five-year survival rate is low. So to medical researchers, they're very interested in knowing what's the fundamental reason that causes the difference between those two groups of women. And there are many studies now. There are a total of five studies. The first study is, well, is, is most complete. It's called TCGA study. And you can think of this as, say, they take measurements of genomic markers at many, many different locations. And you have full observation, but not too many subjects. In addition to this study, the total of four other studies, they only take measurements on a subset of variables. And so there's a big chunk of them missing. And you, you are faced with exactly the same question. You either apply statistical analysis to the first data set or the second, or is a way to combine them together. We have an integrated analysis of the whole data set. And turns out there are ways to do that. Another interesting and slightly different kind of application is in climate study. And people are very concerned about climate change. And of course, most of the concern is about the future. What's going to happen in the next 50 or 100 years? But human history is very short. We actually don't know much about weather or temperature. The climate records are only available after 1850. So it's about 160 years. And 160 years in terms of human history or the history of Earth is teeny tiny. It's very short. So in order to know what's going to happen in the future, first we need to know what happened before. Say, what's the temperature in Hong Kong 200 years ago? We have no idea. So the temperature, real temperature information is very incomplete. But many ancient records, they're stored in proxies, like in ice core, in, uh, in big trees or old trees, and also in rocks. And those gives us indirect information about temperature or climate. So if we think about this in the same style as the previous example, what we have is something like this. In terms of temperature, we have many locations, but it's only available, say, from year uh, 1850 up to 2013 or 2016. And there's a big chunk here that's unknown. Whatever zero means, it's unknown. But on the other hand, we have other proxies. And those proxies gives us information about temperature for a much longer period of time. So the question is, can we utilize the information on the observed part to get an estimate of this unknown part? So all of this type of problem can be formulated as what's called structured matrix compression. So in structured matrix compression, it's different from the Netflix problem I mentioned earlier. In there, you have random observations or observations at random locations. Here, you have observations by row and by column. So you either observe a complete row or observe a complete column. And after permutation, the problem can be formulated as this type of problem. You have big data matrix, but only observe those three blocks. There's a big chunk. This chunk actually is much, much larger than the observed one. The question is, can we recover that piece? And the problem is very interesting and, and also has many applications, I, as I have mentioned a moment ago. And finally, I want to say something about Another very interesting problem at the moment, and it's a very challenging problem for statisticians and also computer scientists. It's about computing uh, statistics and the computing. And for in the last three or four years, people have discovered a range of statistic, high dimensional statistical problems where for statistically optimal procedure, we are able to show that 
they must be computationally infeasible. And before that, we only realize there's a problem. But we are still searching. Maybe we are not smart enough, right? There might be other methods that's both good and fast. And after a while, without success, people start doubting whether that goal can be achieved. It turns out those two goals cannot be achieved simultaneously. And that uh, a range of problems, some of them are well known. For example, sparse PCA and submatrix detection and localization. In this case, you observe a big matrix with noise. And the underlying truth is a very high dimensional matrix, but everywhere it's zero, just on a small unknown submatrix. That's the value is, is non-zero. And the question is either to detect the existence of such a submatrix or to locate, to identify the location of the such submatrix. And the problem without regarding to computation, the problem can be solved. I can take you a very simple example. Suppose a big matrix is 10,000 by 10,000. And I tell you that there's a 10 by 10 submatrix somewhere buried inside. And without concern about computation, it's easy. You just scan. You search all 10 by 10 possible submatrices. For each given one, you compute, for example, sum of squares, because they contain signal. If you take sum of squares, it has to be larger than the parts that without the signal. So you identify the highest, largest one, you're done. But if you think about computing, such an algorithm is not useful because you need to search over 10,000 choose 10. 10 is small. 10,000 choose 10 for the rows, and 10,000 choose 10 for the columns. So you need to search over a space of 10,000 choose 10 squared. And of course, it can be much larger. If it's 100 by 100, then it's impossible. And so the question is, what's the optimal trade-off between statistical accuracy and computational efficiency? And at the moment, there's no answer to that question. So for the students, if they're interested in this type of problem, this is a very good problem to think about. Because as a statistician, we want the method to be good. Anything that's come out of the algorithm should be good. Otherwise, what's the point, right? But for practice, you need to be able to compute. If something is optimal and something is not computable, it's not useful. So somehow, we need to make a balance between those two goals. And that problem is a very hard problem. Another kind of problem that's related to computing is what's called distributed inference. So data are too big. You don't have a single place to hold all of them. Or you have a single place, but you cannot access all of them all at once. And virtually all existing statistical methods and theory is under the assumption that we have, say, x and y, we want to find out the relationship between x and y. We do high dimensional linear regression, or we want to estimate the high dimensional covariance matrix. But what if you don't have the space to look at all the data all at once? And actually, in the most extreme case, the data set, the dimension is so high, each time you can only read one row into the computer. Then you need to summarize the information. You compute the mean, you compute the variance, you compute something you like, something that's very, of, of very low dimension. Then you have to delete that first row before you read the second row. But at the end of the day, we want to know something about the whole data matrix. The question is, what kind of information you need to keep? Uh, in less extreme case, of course, you imagine you have 10,000 computers, and the data sets are distributed among those 10,000 computers. And each time, you can operate on any one of them. And the question is, how can you summarize the information at the very end? And there are many 
problems of this type. For example, you want to do PCA on a data no noisy singular value decomposition, or you want to do PCA assuming you have IID data. But the data are not given on a single computer. They're, they're located in many, many different places. And there are some recent research in the last few months. So it's measured in months, not in years. So it's very beginning. So the problem is that the dimension P is so large, it's not possible to load the whole data matrix in a single place and apply your best method to the whole data set. You're only allowed to operate on a small subset of data at any given time. But the goal is the same. You want to make optimal statistical inference uh, under this constraint. And in some problem, it turns out it's possible to make, uh, to have accuracy as if everything is all together. The simplest problem is estimating the mean. You can imagine it's easy. But estimating the variance or regression or something more difficult Certainly, this distributed inference, the accuracy is not as good as say, having the whole data set in one single place. And I also want to say a few words about opportunities to students. And if you are already studying statistics, you are in the right field. We are in the golden age of statistics. If you are thinking, and you should definitely try, if you are studying something else, maybe you should switch. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's all sorts of opportunities. And I, I know people in industry, they couldn't find enough people with the good statistical skills for their company. I have a friend who has 29 companies. And according to him, 28 of them involves big data. And as CEO of so many companies, his Main challenge is not getting money. The tons of not money people want to invest in his companies. His big challenge is to find hire good people. He always asks me, "Do you have a student?" My student. I, so far, no one interested. <laughs> First of all, the problem is very interesting. It's very exciting, and it's truly interdisciplinary. And this type of problem comes from many different fields and also requires a wide range of skills for people in statistics, computer science, applied math, and many, many other areas. Another is many different companies want people with this type of skills. And in the US, for example, tech companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, you name it, have a wide, wide range of companies. And for our own students, because I'm in the business school, and some of them go to those companies if they're not going to industry. And now they uh, also, they used to be only interested in financial companies. If they don't go to industry, they, go, uh, they don't, go, don't go to academia, they go to Wall Street, like Goldman Sachs, Renaissance, and other companies. And now those companies are facing strong competition from the other tech companies. And it, the problems are actually very interesting. It's huge, the data set, and you need to handle them with a lot of skills. So they're not like simple applications of t-test. And, and in the US, I think it's fair to say that all major universities are expanding their statistical programs. And it's very, very useful. And the reason I have uh, this slide and also next slide was I, I have given another talk in China and aiming towards because there are people who can fund these type of programs like presidents of universities and it's I think I made a convincing argument. Uh, here's the headline from New York Times. It's Chinese version of New York Times and I think it's everywhere that in the US and people are trying to produce more and more statisticians and also data scientists. And this is 
a report by the consulting company McKinsey about big data. I think we can skip the details. And according to their estimates, the US alone faces a shortage of 140 to 190,000 people who can do real data analysis. And in addition, they need 1.5 million managers and analysts who can understand their reports. So that's a huge number. And I think we can clearly see the number of students who want to be learning more statistics or in statistics major. And even I'm here, I'm going to teach two sections of undergraduate course at, at Penn. It's already full. So I got tons of emails from students every day and try to get into the get into the class and I have to check with my secretary many times, ask her whether we can get a big room because it's not nearly enough to accommodate those requests. And this is a picture I took at Pudong Airport. I arrived at Pudong Airport a few days ago and as I was going through uh, before I went through the custom, I saw this ad on their wall. It's about IBM. And you can see that this is about football, and, you, and it requires big data. This tells you that it's everywhere. I hope that I have given you enough examples to show that big data is interesting and statistical techniques and and analysis is very useful for a wide range of problems. Although I don't have time to tell you some of the solution, or to, to tell you the solution to some of those problems. But the whole purpose is to convince you that at least the problems are interesting. And if you feel that way, I think I have achieved my goal. But in case you're more technical and you want to know more about some of those problems and yeah, a few papers uh, I worked on in the last few years. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so, so um, you know, one of the great things about big data is that obviously there's, you know, it's sort of become a buzzword where there's lots of hype and we've sort of gotten people who wouldn't have been interested in anything remotely near statistics interested, right? Uh, That's good. But uh, <laughs> one of the problems with that is that uh, you know, this name data scientist has sort of been hijacked, right? So you have people <laughs> who, are, have, who are essentially maybe data handlers uh, claiming to be data scientists, which is all fine with me, except then there's this notion of exclusion that somehow statisticians are no longer data scientists when we've always been data scientists. So, uh, you know, I, I see this on perhaps on this campus in some ways, and certainly other places where it's, um, sometimes statisticians aren't included in that conversation. I think that's kind of weird, but that's the reality. And, uh, you know, the way I view this thing is it's very much, let's take something very simple like a biostatistics. Biostatistics, statisticians play a role where they're called biostatisticians, but they don't work in isolation. They always work with experts in biology or whatever. So what I'm basically saying is something what we call data science is of course interdisciplinary. But at the core, they're statisticians, you know, at, in, in that mix. And yeah. I just wonder what you feel about how, for instance, a place like this, we can sort of say, okay, look, we are an essential component of that mix, right? Yeah, I, I certainly agree. It's almost like you find, you discover a new territory and everyone wants to claim it. And I, my, my understanding of data science is that it's sort of a combination of statistics and computer scientists. And we should emphasize over and over again, data processing is not data analysis. And we do prediction, we provide accuracy statement. We, are, we don't just say do uh, an algorithm without knowing the underlying say, reason for coming up with that algorithm. We have theoretical justification for that. 
And on the other hand, I think it, it will take a lot of effort from statisticians to try to take ownership of this new piece of territory. Otherwise, it will be claimed by computer scientists. Yeah. But I think one way or another, they need us. Yeah, we are good. We are good at what we do. Bye. I have a somewhat, uh, I have a different question and, and kind of a comment uh, related to his remark. My, my field is economics. Uh -huh. And there are lots and lots of charlatans in uh -huh. economics, meaning individuals who pose as expert economists who don't know anything about economics. And we have to work hard to retain ownership of our discipline and make sure that the experts are the the actual experts are the one informing the policy makers and voters have to be careful about who they believe who says what about the economy it's just a process that goes on it's exactly the same process that was talked about here but my other question pertains to your medical applications uh -huh. and the possibility of an eotropic outcome eotropic outcome uh -huh. Do you know what that is that's when we look at the individual, decide, we, 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 we get a detection, the, the physician or the uh, healthcare professional intervenes and creates a worse situation. And that's quite common. That's very, very common in, uh, in these large data investigations of actually creating the, we're, we're, we're the very act of measurement and then uh, intervention creates a worse outcome. I can give you, you know, there are many, yeah, yeah, many examples around. And, and do you think right? there's a role for the statistician in informing the healthcare <laughs> professionals about the nature or the probabilities of um, eotropic outcomes or the, the bad things that can happen? Here, I thought it was all biased towards only finding good things. You know, we find we, we detect uh, possibility of cancer, we treat it, the person might get better. Actually, we can make things worse. Of course, because yeah. individuals respond to different treatments differently. Yeah, but and, what is the role of statistician in that? And, and we can certainly do a lot, of, a lot of work in that area by providing, say, more accurate statistical analysis, and including, say, taking into account of multiplicity and, uh, and our inference after model selection and all those type of all those type of things, because those type of concern is often not recognized by, say, medical professions. They look for what they want to look for. And we do a more principled analysis. The, the, the problem, of course, is very complex. And for any given individual, there's no guarantee that treatment will make the person better. It's, yeah. And I think for, for our role is try to build more accurate database and do more accurate statistical analysis. And, but there's no simple answer to your oh, question. No <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Tsai, for your uh, informative speech. Um, um, you know, uh, data can be collected, accessed, or uh, used in a wrong way uh, if it's in wrong hands. So what's your opinion about data privacy or security issues? Oh yeah, that's that's another big area at the moment about data privacy. I'm certainly no expert on that area, but but that's a major concern to people. That's why there are all sorts of technique techniques recently being developed to preserve the accuracy of data analysis, but also to preserve the privacy. Because that's a big problem. And even last week I was at a conference and people asked whether we have a way to make signature to the data set. A company, for example, say, say a medical research institute provides this data set to you for your research, but somehow you sell this data set to another person, and that person makes wrong use of the data set. And the question is, can we somehow put signature on the data set so that we know where this comes from? It's like a watermark. That kind of problem is very interesting, but I think at the moment it's still very early age, uh, early stage of research. That kind of goes back to what the gentleman was talking about. You had on the earlier slide, you had applications of big data. Uh, uh, they were all in this sort of benevolent frame. Yeah. 
But if I'm a government, okay, I want to know everything about you, right? So, and that's going to David privacy, but that's actually something that I want to access, right? And yes. so it's sort of a, a twofold question. One is a moral question. So as we are the so-called, the people who may be involved in that, and we may say, if in the U.S. I want to get a grant from the NSA or the, some DOD or ONR, Maybe um, they'll rather know everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, the question, so, I mean, so the question is, I mean, there's a sort of a, a flip side to big data that we often ignore, and that is really about uh, it's a kind of a weaponization in, in, in you know in many respects. And yeah, that, that's, that's certainly a very and, valid, valid. And so concern. you know, we we are uh, faced as researchers as sort of again as sort of a moral standpoint where you so you know you go back to the idea of when people were doing uh, things about nuclear bombs and things like that, and we have to decide, do we want to participate, right? And, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's just more of a comment, but uh, I think that's a very realistic situation. I mean, if I have a cell phone and I upload an image, somebody knows I uploaded that image. That's crazy, you know, that's scary. And so where, where, where do we get off, I mean, where do we say, okay, it either we're developing ways of getting around that, or we're saying, okay, I'm really excited about that research, and I don't care about the morality, I, I think it's really cool, I think it's gonna help my country, for instance. I mean, uh, where, do, where do we draw the line, right? Yeah, certainly anything that's good often also has side effects, right? Including, say, nuclear technology. It's very useful to generate electricity. It can also be made as a weapon. I think this goes back to the earlier question about data privacy. Right. So ideally, we want to have uh, privatized that data so that you can no longer, no longer identify the individual. Uh, you can still provide, the data collectively can still provide very accurate information as a whole. So we can still do statistical analysis uh, without being able to identify any particular individual or any any particular group. But the question you raised is much larger than statistics. Hi, so that was, so I'm just going to change, change gears a little bit and talk about the industry use of, of the statistical data right now. So, um, uh, right, so right now, there's a lot, lot of companies like Google pushing for what's called cognitive computing. Have you heard about you've heard about that? So it's so obviously it's going to change how we analyze data, how we look at data, and I was just and I and I just wanted to to, to get to get your feedback on some of the drawbacks on it, some of the advantages and yeah. I I I, I think that technique is still at a very early stage and I personally don't know enough to make I think very informative comments about that. It's just one particular technique. We still don't know how, I guess, how powerful the te technique is. Let me give you a, a, a slightly technical question. So I work a bit on uh, financial data, and uh, in your slide, what the slide about the epilepsy? Epilepsy, yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. It, it looks like stock yeah, reversed. Like yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> does, for example, the yeah, arch or gauge model help? Uh, uh, certainly, you, you mean for financial data or for EEG data? For EEG data, it, 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 uh, so it's so different. Two series. Yeah, two series, yeah. Look almost uh, exactly like a financial. Yeah, it, it, it's similar to financial, financial return. It's also similar to uh, seismic, uh, seismic data. And, and if, if this can be solved or, or can be well understood, we can also predict the earthquake better than we do uh -huh. now. Uh, I don't think that GACH data, uh, GACH model itself is that useful for analysis of EEG. Uh, come with a, with a follow-up to what, to what he was saying. Every big data set is not necessarily good. The Germans were collecting big data census data. And the census data are what the Nazis used to identify whose grandmother was Jewish. <laughs> I'm serious. Okay. 
And so ever since then, the, the Germans have been very, very skeptical of collecting a census. And uh, I think now they, they do like a, like, like a 2% sample, something like that. So it was a big data set used for a very evil purpose. And my point is that, and this happens in economics, there is no way for the academic statistician, I don't think, to stay out of the policy area. In economics, we have to get involved with the policy, how the economics is being used. You just, we just can't stand back, look, and kind of advise. We've got to, we, that, there's a whole field called welfare economics about, about this, and, and I think you're going to need something like welfare statistics, mm -hmm. which, is, which, is, which is the use and misuse and the optimal use of the data that, that, that's being collected. Yeah, certainly that's a very important point. But again, this goes outside of statistics itself. Uh, it's related. <laughs> it's related, but, but, but at least so far, I think the focus is that given the data, what's the best way to analyze it? Yeah, in terms of your question relates to the goal. Why you want to analyze the data? For what purpose? I, I think what he's saying is, is, is now that we recognize the importance of big data, and it's big in the front, in your <laughs> face, that we, we, in a sense, may not be able to sh just, just you know, say, okay, we're just analyzing the data. Maybe we can't do that anymore. And I think yeah. that's what he's saying. Yeah. That in the future, because you're saying, this is so terribly important to everything, uh, you know, uh, we can't just say, okay, we're just the guys analyzing this stuff and leave us alone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean yeah, I'll, I'll say that, you know. Yeah, because so, the question is about <laughs> the ethics yeah, yeah. of yeah. data analysis. That's right, that's right, that's right. So there may be a new emerging field. <laughs> um, it, just, just getting back to the point of uh, scalability, you mentioned that. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes it's not necessarily about, you know, you're, you know, one part of big data is sometimes data mining where you're swimming through and trying to find useful <coughs> stuff. And then there's some some things like, let's say, financial transactions at Goldman Sachs over the last 10 years. They want every piece of that information. So it's not, so I think you mentioned this, but it, it's not always the case where, where we, we want to throw away some of the data. We need to process all of that data. And you said something like this when you talk about developing methods to do that. And yeah, you want to develop good statistical methods right, to right. analyze the data under the computation of yeah. constraint. And, 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 you know, but again, this, this kind of goes back to, the, to, in a way, what you're saying. I mean, we're statisticians. We're not necessarily experts in that aspect of the computational aspect. And it, it's more about, again, being interdisciplinary in the sense of being able to talk to people who call themselves data scientists and are doing the other aspects of it, that, you know, that are complementary, but nothing... Not, not one of it subsumes the other or, uh, you know, and again... Yeah, you need collaboration yeah. from yeah. people in different yeah. fields. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that some of these type of problems can be solved no. by statisticians yeah. alone. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, that's just, hi, thank you for our talk. Uh, my question is that in the area of big data, we know that a very popular method called deep learning has achieved quite great success. In uh, different applications, uh, including some applications that you mentioned your slides. So my, uh, my question is, uh, what's your opi opinion about deep learning uh, as a black box method? Uh, about deep learning? Yeah, I think at the moment it certainly has achieved a very significant empirical success, but I don't think there's any theoretical investigation of the method, just like uh, neural network before or other methods before. It can be eventually, say, justified in theory. But so far, there's no justification. So as a method, it's fine. You can use it for many applications. But we simply don't know enough about its theoretical properties. I think it will take, because the method itself is, is not so easy to analyze. Otherwise, people have done it already. And I think it will take a lot more effort. And eventually, we will gain more understanding about the method, just like any other, say, uh, interesting method, random forest or other methods, that eventually you find justification. And I think that step will be a very important step.
If no more questions, let's thank Professor Tai for his wonderful talk again. <laughs>